Hello and welcome. We're starting into week two. You all have uh, done a fantastic job already beginning these conversations uh, under the questions from our two leaders for this week, so I really appreciate that. Please uh, remember to keep in mind to always uh, show your work in your posts, which means when you when you hear me here, when you reference our readings, our videos, our songs, whatever it is, right? And many of you have been doing this. I really appreciate it. Uh, give me the a parentheses with the page number, and if there is no page number, give me the video clip name or some some identifying mark, right? Because as I read through these, I read through them a couple of times. I, I read through them first just very quickly across the whole page of all the posts and try to get a sense for, okay, who's actually engaging the texts? Because that's what I want, especially with this first post. I want to see that you're reading and engaging and thinking, right? Um, and, and, and then I go back and I read for content. I read, okay, how did you respond to the question, right? And how did, uh, did, did you just describe something the book says, which is great because that means you're reading the text and you're trying to understand it. Or did you uh, describe and push us into a, a application or analysis or critique or something, right? Or how are you engaging the text, not just describing the text? So try to, try to, I mean, I'm asking a lot in a short amount of word count, um, but it's a skill in and of itself that I, I hope that you're able to develop as we go through. In this essay, or essay, uh, in this quick uh, lecture, I just wanted to talk a little bit about our two authors for this week so that uh, we don't get lost in these things, right? So first, I'm, I'm having you read some Thomas Aquinas, and this dude's writing in the Middle Ages, right, in the 1200s. And as a result, he's speaking in ways that we don't normally speak today, right? His whole form, like, we don't write in this sort of stylistic, here's an objection, I'm going to answer the objection one. I am, and you know, all this kind of like this formulaic thing. Uh, the dude is the canonized doctor of the Catholic Church, which means he's one of the primary teachers of the of the Catholic Church. So uh, after his death, somewhere along the way, he was canonized, and uh, his teachings on theology were adopted as this is this is going to be our stance. If we're going to have a doctrinal stance, this is going to be it, right? And the Catholic Church is, uh, some parts have been more rigid on that than others, right? But, but Aquinas is a big deal within this tradition. Uh, the meat of what Aquinas says is not in the objections. The objections, he's going to bring in various authorities, and the authorities are going to compete with one another, right? So this says this, this says something else, this third thing says this totally other thing, right? Those are sort of popular opinion stuff for his day. The meat of what he wants to say is in the section titled, I Answer That. Okay? And then he's going to go through after that section and give you replies to the objections that he said above. Right? So it's kind of clunky to read, right? Uh, but, but try to figure out what he's up to. Aquinas is an Aristotelian. He loves Aristotle. He calls him the philosopher with a capital P. Okay? So it's no accident, no pun intended, as we're talking about accidents and potentiality and all this other philosophical stuff. It's no accident that in this five proofs for, the, for God's existence that he has five proofs because what these are are Aristotle's five means of causality. So there's a, a cause from motion. There's a cause, there's a deficient cause, right? All the way down to the, to the uh, purpose or design cause. And, and, and if you look at one uh, phenomenon, right, a, a domino falling over, we can explain why that domino fell over in, according to Aristotle and then Aquinas, five different ways, right? The, why did this one fall? Because this one right behind it, uh, fell over and knocked it over. Why did this one fall? Because the first one knocked them all over. Why did this one fall? Because they're all set up like this, right? Why did this one? Fall? And so you see, like, um, there's different ways, different angles, right, that we're looking at the, the question of causality, five different ways, right? And pay attention to what he says. 
uh, he's, he tries to be very careful and doesn't say, and this cause is God. He says instead, and this is what people call God. All Aquinas is doing is it's a very modest move, is to say it's logical to think. And if it's logical to think, this is why he calls what he's doing a science, right? He doesn't mean science in a very technical way that we mean it today. But the science of logic, of, of deducing, right, down. It's logical to think that there is a first cause that put all these other things in these five different ways into motion. Okay? This is what conventionally people will call God. So that's a second jump that he makes. And yes, he's trying to prove God's existence, but first he proves that it's logical to think that there's a first cause. And then we're going to, and later the stuff that I'm not having you read, he's going to address, okay, how is it that we can move, not using the Bible for as a revelation point, something that gives us some kind of special knowledge about God, but just what is it that our minds can think by observing the natural world, world around us? to where it's not at least illogical to think that there's a first cause out there, right? And this first cause for Aquinas is categorically different than all of the stuff that's normally in the realm of causality, right? So if this first cause is God, it's God that's totally and wholly outside of the chain of cause and effects in those five different ways, and not on the same plane. And this is going to be a point of tension between him and Bertrand Russell. Although Bertrand Russell comes, um, you know, 600 years after Aquinas. So they're not really having a conversation. But we're putting him in conversation. Uh, Bertrand Russell says, well, no, it's illogical to think that this first cause is up here. We need to understand causality like causality runs. So Bertrand Russell is going to want to point him over here, right, and put put that first cause or what we're calling God in that same chain. And he thinks that's illogical or at least it's, it's, we, we haven't proven beyond a shadow of a doubt to use legal term uh, that God actually exists, right? That a first cause even exists. He's just not convinced by this. And that brings me to Bertrand Russell. And I'm not going to say a ton about Bertrand Russell, except he's not an atheist. So please don't type him as an atheist. We're talking about belief and unbelief. And in this, in the, in the class, right, uh, we're not going to have any like super solid, this is what belief is, although Aquinas might fit there a little bit. And this is what unbelief is. And we're pitting sort of theism against atheism a, a little. But at the end of the day, Russell is very careful to say he's, a, he's an agnostic about matters of God. He thinks there's not enough evidence to prove to him at this point in his life conclusively that God exists. And he's a very, I mean, the dude's a smart dude. He has a degree in mathematics. He got a Nobel Prize in literature. I mean, he's, he wrote with uh, philosopher Whitehead, the philosopher, right? Uh, and wrote a fantastic mathematics book with this philosopher. He's, he's, he's smart. He was denied visas uh, to travel around the world because he was constantly uh, under threat of being thrown in jail for uh, protesting nuclear arms and war. So this dude is a self-professed agnostic, but also a humanitarian, and he identifies as a humanitarian. And he ultimately, at the end of the day, thinks that science offers the most logical proof or evidence um, for how to live our life. And it has a methodology that's corrective and allows for difference in, in such a way that it's sort of a strict dogmatism he doesn't think allows. Right. So... Again, I can't reiterate this enough because a lot of students in other courses, when I do this, um, when I teach this class in other contexts, miss this point. Russell's not an atheist. He's an agnostic. All right. So I leave you with those two things, and I hope that uh, your continued conversation throughout this week is as engaging as uh, it started off. So thank you for that, and I'll talk to you soon.